looking at the early church in Acts, and we're seeing that uh, the, the massive and rapid growth, uh, the spread of the gospel was not the result of uh, modern day marketing, uh, uh, heavy uh, financing, uh, charismatic uh, leadership, but that it was the result of the power of God and being submissive to the Word and the teaching of Jesus. All the way back from Acts 1.8 when He said, You are to be My witnesses. Uh, all the way through as we're traveling, we we're seeing them uh, simply and yet profoundly obeying what Jesus had very simply and yet profoundly told them to do. And that was to be His witnesses. We are seeing uh, in these last couple of weeks, including today, of uh, two disciples in particular, Peter and John. People that uh, uh, we would not have written this story if we had only known them in the Gospel accounts. Uh, the, the attitudes and the actions that we saw of these two, when, when we see John and his brother, we see two that are uh, kind of wanting some position thinking that the kingdom is about the political overthrow and they'd like to be up there as Secretary of the Interior or, or some kind of high-ranking position. After all, they've given up everything to follow Jesus. And then we see uh, Simon Peter, Simon the son of John, uh, who uh, is so overtly on fire for what he perceives as the Messianic coming. Uh, that he just wants to destroy everything in sight and everybody in sight and, and would not even allow Jesus, uh, if, he could, uh, if He could, to make what He saw as missteps uh, that Jesus was making. Uh, and yet He is the very one who denies even knowing Christ when the time gets difficult. We would not have written today's stories and last week's stories if all that we had known was their walking with Christ and and the selfishness and the arrogance and uh, the misunderstandings that we find them, with them in the Gospel. But then there was the resurrection. And of course the resurrection changed. It changed everything. It didn't immediately change. It took, it took a few weeks. It took them with Jesus uh, uh, having uh, risen from the dead and continuing to teach and continuing to refocus. But now, now they... They see what the Messiah really came to do. They see what Jesus' intent was. They understand their need to be witnesses and to spread the Gospel. And the good news for you and me is that we're on this side of the resurrection. And we know that as well. We don't have to wonder what it is that God would have us to do as a church, as a family, as an individual. Uh, God has revealed that to us and we just simply as these disciples we follow them. But boy, what a crazy culture we live in, huh? I mean, what a, what a difficult and strange time these last few years have been of the rise of hate, with the rise of, 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 of political popularity and, and, and really the polarization of peoples and, and the infusion of that into every aspect of life, even into churches. Uh, it creates such a confusion. Wouldn't it be something? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if, if uh, the culture that we're going through today, which is very modern, very new, and all the ideas are, are certainly all brand new, wouldn't it be amazing if we could just find something in Scripture to tell us how to live that? I mean, the Bible was great for 2,000 years ago, but wouldn't it be great if we could find something now? So today's message is called Cancel Culture, circa 33 A.D., I want to talk to you about what we see as modern, clever, cool, moving, uh, everybody understands it now. Turns out that's not anything new. Turns out that was with us all the way back 2,000 something almost years ago, uh, right at the, the, the on, uh, uh, birth of, uh, uh, of the early church and, and this rising movement. There were those who were trying to silence them. If you don't know what cancel culture is, uh, that is just basically where uh, mobs of people, often on social media, uh, they just gather together with the, because you have opposed uh, popular thinking. And now it is cool to just shut you down. And as I would mentioned in Sunday school, uh, that includes redefining what things mean. So the things that you thought you were against, 
uh, things that you thought you understood, well, that's been redefined now. And boy, aren't there a lot of redefinitions. There are constantly things are being redefined now. And you have to keep up with it or else you just get shut down. You have to educate yourself, right? That's the world that we live in. It's silly, it's crazy, but it's not new. It's been around since 33 A.D. And, and, and really the, the theme for today's message and, and maybe the, the idea that I want to carry forward is not even in Acts, but it's in Paul's letter that he wrote to the Corinthians. And he makes a statement in there. He's talking about really people that are uh, saying, uh, accusing Paul of whether or not he is a, a genuine follower or not. You know, they're trying to cancel Paul, all right? They're, they're trying to shut him down. And Paul says, you know what, I'm going to show up. And when I show up, I want to talk to these people, but I really don't want to talk to you. I just want to see what you're doing. Because I'm not interested in your words. I'm interested in what, in, in what you're actually, the actual fruits of your life. And he says in 1 Corinthians uh, 4.20, he says, For the kingdom of God, it does not consist in talk, but in power. So I want to see, with all these words and all of this posting that you're doing, I want to see if there's any power there. If there's any effectiveness there. And that's really how we have to deal with the issues today is we need to look beyond the words. And we need to look for the power. We need to look for the power of God because the power of the kingdom is what's important, Paul tells us. And that's what we're going to see is important uh, many years before, uh, decades before with Peter and John. And I'm going to give you the statement and that is that the counter to this culture we're in today is not by debate, but it's by demonstration. All right? That it's not by debate, because debate is words, but it's by demonstration. Demonstration is power. The way that you counter the cultural uh, swing and, and the temptation, especially of your children, to follow through with that, it's not going to be by arguing. It's going to be by demonstrating your life. By showing people that this truth uh, is demonstrable in your life and that you live it. Uh, it. It doesn't matter if people redefine whether it's good or not. That's okay. But that you continue to consistently live and demonstrate the words of God lived through your life. The counter to this culture is demonstration. It's by you demonstrating and showing that power. But when we come to Acts chapter 4 and before we get get there this morning. Uh, well, we're, we're there at verse 8. But uh, I want to I bring you up to that, that Peter, uh, in, at the end of chapter 3, uh, uh, he uh, had brought this healed man, this man that had been crippled. Uh, he brought him uh, with him into the temple area, drew a huge crowd. Some 5,000 people are saved on that one day as the result of 5,000 men, maybe even more than that, with the women and children, but uh, as a result of seeing the, the healing, that it was done for a purpose to spread the gospel and people received and accepted it. But because of it, uh, it made the powers to be angry, which is the, uh, the, the, the uh, Sanhedrin council, which was uh, controlled in large measure at this point by the Sadducees. And the Sadducees was a sect of Jewish religion uh, that held very tightly to the first five books of the Old Testament, and that most notably denied resurrection. They denied the idea of resurrection. They didn't believe in that. Now, the Pharisees believed in it. The Pharisees held to that because the Old Testament taught it. So they, they, they held to that, but the Sadducees did not. But isn't it strange uh, how politics make strange bedfellows and how they were coming together because now by being together they're able to share power. And they have just a tremendous amount of power as allowed by the Roman government. Now, they have a high priest, Annas, but Annas has been deposed by the Roman government. His son Caiaphas has been put by the Romans as the high priest. So you see Annas and Caiaphas, but Annas is kind of the one that really the, the locals still look to as the high priest. Uh, and, and they're all about power. In fact, Annas will see not only Caiaphas, but you'll see other sons and even a grandson appointed high priest in it during his lifetime. And that position, uh, that's the highest ranking position uh, outside of the Roman government itself, and they gave them a lot of leeway. So they've got a lot of power that they need to hang on to. And you know, it always comes down to power. It always comes down to political power and force. That's always the answer, it seems, uh, from the world's standpoint. And so it had infiltrated 
uh, the Jewish religion. And so they didn't like what uh, Peter and John had done with this man, even though he had been miraculously healed. And so uh, they wanted to put him on trial. But it was evening when they get a hold of them, and so they just put him in jail overnight. And the next morning, uh, they bring them to their trial. And boy, they, uh, they're going to do to Peter and John, who, by the way, are just second-ranked fishermen from Galilee. They're not anybody important. They're not in any uh, famous rabbinical school. They don't have any notoriety to them. They're just a couple of nobodies. And so they're going to do to them what they do to everybody, all these insurrectionists, all these people that try to mess up the status quo. And, and, and what they're going to do is they're going to intimidate them. So you've got Annas, you've got Caiaphas, you've got all Jason, you've got all these others that are gathered around that are part of this, this Sanhedrin super court, and you've got the Sanhedrin council, and you bring these two ragtag people in before them, and they say, by whose power are you healing? Uh, they don't say anything about the man because it turns out the guy's standing right between them. So it's kind of hard to even talk about the subject because of this guy who's more than 40 years old, as it turns out, uh, who has been a beggar all his life, yeah, he's standing there. They know. They walk past him every day too. Sometimes they threw a, 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 a shekel toward him, but sometimes they did not. But yeah, it's obviously standing there. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to say, where did this come from? Okay? Uh, which side? You know, was this, which God are you worshiping here? And so Peter decides to answer that question. And in Acts 4 8, it says, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's so key. That's so key. We've been talking about the power of the Holy Spirit and what it takes to be unstoppable. And it takes the Holy Spirit's power to be unstoppable. And so we're going to see what unstoppable looks like. It doesn't look like you thought, because uh, if we thought the Holy Spirit was going to be unstoppable, we wouldn't be spending a night in jail. But these guys spend a night in jail small price to pay for the salvation of 5,000 people, by the way. But nonetheless, for, from a lot of modern standards, it doesn't look like the Holy Spirit's doing a whole lot, when in fact, the Holy Spirit has put them exactly where He wants to put them. Okay? And one way I know that is because of Gamaliel. Now, you won't see about Gamaliel here, but Gamaliel is one of the people on the Sanhedrin. He's also the teacher of a guy named Saul, whose name will be changed in Scripture to Paul. And it is because of Gamaliel's connection to Paul and Paul's subsequent telling to Luke that we're going to even know what these people talk about in the, uh, when Peter and John are taken out of the room and they have a private council. Because Gamaliel will come to terms with all of this reality soon enough. So... Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, he said to them very politely, he said, rulers of the people and elders, you know, I recognize who you are. But I've got a question for you. Next verse. He said, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Okay, I get it. If you're wanting to know how was it that he was healed? Okay, let me tell you. I'll just tell you right up front. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Jesus Messiah, Messiah Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucify. Boy, you could hear a pin drop. Whom God raised from the dead. Oh, you could hear groaning over in the Sadducee side of the hall. God raised from the dead. By Him, this man is standing before you well this Jesus he goes on to say is the stone that was rejected by you the builders which has become the cornerstone now that let's don't get past that because that is such a vital verse for us that Luke includes because what this shows I think this is the statement that that suddenly threw the room because they had gathered with all of their regalia, and those guys are in their ragtag clothes, and they leaned forward, by what power have you done this? Well, they know what power, by what power. They knew the answer to the question like a good lawyer. They already knew what the answer was to the question that they were asking. But they didn't expect these ragtag Galileans without formal education to come up with an appropriate biblical verse to apply to the situation. So this is huge. Not only did they quote Scripture, but they quoted the right Scripture. They said, you know, remember that what it says in Psalms? 
that uh, the, there's going to be a stone that the builders reject that's going to turn out to be the most important stone in the construction, the actual cornerstone of the building. Well, you're the builders. They had all uh, been raised to believe that the nations were the builders and that they had somehow thrown out Israel and that Israel was the stone. And, and so they had interpreted it that way. But now here's what he's saying. You're, you guys are the builders. And, and you've thrown out the most important stone, a cornerstone. Cornerstone to what? Well, the cornerstone to the temple. But not the physical temple. The physical temple was very important for them because that's where their power resided, right? So they had to have that. And now he's saying that there's another temple being built. And it's not a temple that's made with real stones. It's a temple that's made on the basis of the foundation of Jesus. And Jesus Himself is that cornerstone. The very thing that you dismissed. Remember, I just told you, you crucified Him. All right? Turns out He was the most important part of the whole puzzle here. He is the one for which all this is for. Can you imagine uh, what it took to have the boldness to stand up without any defense attorneys, without any backing, without any social media accounts, without being an influencer on Facebook, without any of this kind of stuff, and to just tell people who just got through crucifying your leader that they are wrong. And they don't even understand their own Scripture. They don't even interpret it correctly. That this Jesus is the stone that you rejected who is the cornerstone of a new temple. Who is the most important stone of all and you didn't even recognize it. You just, it just went by you. It just shows your ignorance. Well, if that was politically incorrect, it was nothing compared to the next thing that he's about to say, which is the, one of the most politically incorrect sentences in not only the New Testament, but in the history of mankind. Politically incorrect. It's so politically incorrect that it is not even mentioned in too many churches today. So he says that he is that cornerstone, uh, and he goes on in verse 12 to say, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men. And that's anthropoi, not androids. So that's not just male men. That's men and women, people. There's no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Not a single other name. That is unacceptable. That's unacceptable today. That is unacceptable in our culture. That's, that is so arrogant. That is so one-sided. That, so, that is so prejudicial. That is so whatever people are going to, to want to do with this, that was also very offensive to them as well. Isn't it interesting how the culture looks at this and hates it? They don't like this. And, and what, the funny part is what they don't like is the no one else part. What they don't see is their is salvation. They missed that part. That there wasn't salvation, but there is salvation. That there is a way that you can be saved. Oh, I'm not even hearing that because I just heard that there's no one else. And that's the world. And that's our culture. And that's what, why we only hear partial parts of sentences and we don't hear the intents and the meanings and we begin to redefine terms and we, 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 we make things so, uh, so anti that really we're not intended when the whole point, what He's trying to tell them is that there is salvation. You too, Pharisees and Sadducees and powerful people, can be saved. There actually is a name under heaven given among people by which you can be saved. And it's the name I just used and demonstrated to you its power by the healing of this man that's standing between me and John. But you're not hearing that, are you? No. Because it's not popular. It's not popular in that room. It goes against, it threatens their future. I mean, my goodness, if Jesus is raised from the dead, then the whole Sadducee argument that there is no resurrection uh, is gone. It also means that, that their idea that, well, we just live and then we die, and so we've got to do what we can while we're still here, and we've got to follow these original tenets, and you've got to look to us to understand what those original tenets are, that uh, 
that there's something more to it than that. That just doesn't help us. And for the Pharisees uh, to say that, well, we were wrong, that all of these rules and things that we have added, turns out you really didn't need all that. Man, you talk about sucking all the power out of the room. Because they had added all their power with all of their oral traditions that they had added to the laws of Moses. And now... There's no other name under heaven given among men by which you may be saved than the name of of Jesus, by whom, by the way, uh, this man was healed from his crippled condition, the demonstration of God's power that was so evident to you. What are you going to do about that? What do we do about it? I tell you, uh, let me give you this statement here, and that is that popularity, it, it never defines truth. All right? A lot of us get caught up with today's version of truth because we're trying to stay popular. Right? We want to stay with our friends. I'm going to say, yeah, I believe what you believe. I believe what you believe. Okay, yeah, we'll do that too. Yeah, we'll do that. I'll march with you. I'll do it. Because we're letting popularity. We don't want to lose our friends. But popularity never defines truth. It didn't for Peter and John. Popularity would have been... Let me tell you what would have happened if Peter and John had agreed with the Sanhedrin. They would have gotten more than 30 pieces of silver. All right? They were willing to give uh, on a risk 30 pieces to Judas Iscariot to just to find Jesus. Imagine if they could get one of those guys who were as poor as church mice to agree that what they had been saying was not true. Chuck Colson, who's long since died, was in that powerful circle under Richard Nixon when the Watergate scandal originally happened and, and uh, he talked about how that uh, uh, when he was in the White House that he had the, the power to you know, call up a C-130 to take him somewhere if he needed to. That the, They just had unbridled power there in the White House and that is true. And he said it was amazing how that a lie that, you know, that the, the Nixon had not done stuff, that that couldn't stay together for, for even three months. Uh, here were the uh, 12 or 14 most powerful people probably in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie together for three months. How do you expect these 12 ragtag people to keep a lie together for their entire life? To one by one be crucified or martyred in some uh, other fashion knowing that at any time they could turn tails, be well-financed, uh, made popular, risen up in society, whatever the payments needed to be, they could become popular people if they would just turn, and they never did. Unless they just happened to know what the truth really was. And it's because they were willing to die for what they knew to be true that they never turned. You see, Popular truth then was that Jesus was a false apostle. Popular truth today is coming in a lot of different forms that we're seeing in social media primarily, also being supported up by a falsified uh, general media that we have. But popularity never defines truth, my friends. It never does. It's not true because it's popular. It's not true because everybody believes it. All right? It only defines preference. Okay? It's not true because I say it's true and it's true for me. That's just my preference. No. Reality defines truth. The reality was that John and Peter had walked for 40 days with the risen Jesus. All right? It wasn't their preference. It wasn't something that they just thought, well, we'll just kind of keep this going. Let's see how far this goes. No, they had a reality to base their truth on. It's the reality that you see in the microscope at the results of the scientific test. Uh, The the realities that you actually observe. Not your preference. Not your social reaching out and, okay, I'm going to go along with this person because they're yelling louder than anybody and I don't want to be canceled. The cancel culture, that's nothing new. Maybe the means is kind of new. They didn't have social media back then, but the reality is that it's still the same thing was happening. 
And the same thing is true today. You're being called upon to suddenly follow and believe in things that in the back of your mind you think, well, you know, yes, I believe that in one way, but the way they're defining it, I don't know if I can go along with that. I need to back up because I've gotten out of camera. Part of my agreement to be pastor is I stand between these boxes. <laughs> no, nah, that's fine. You see, they did not allow what would give them acceptance to determine what they were going to stand for. And so they, uh, they sent them out of the room. So We've got to talk about this. We've got, we, we, we got to talk about it. And, and it tells us in, in the next verse that we've got up here, it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, uh, in other words, the way they said... Uh, 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 yeah, remember that psalm, all right? Remember the, about the builder and the cornerstone? Uh, there is no other name given among men uh, by which you may be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, they're not being intimidated. They're not the shivering. Uh, they're actually being quite bold about this. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, uh, they were astonished. Our intimidation thing didn't work with these guys. And they recognized that they'd been with Jesus. Uh, they were acting like Jesus did. I mean, what a compliment to come from the enemy. Uh, they saw Jesus in these guys. They saw a calm, calmness, and, and an, a, 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 an appreciation and use for the Scriptures that they had had trouble with Jesus about. And they saw that uh, in them. That, that, that they had imitated Christ. And so, they saw this boldness. And that boldness is what we need if we're to counter the, the, the ill effects of, of this cancel culture in our individual lives today. Let me give you this statement. And that is that the best witness to this culture comes not from being woke. It comes from being bold. The best way to witness to this culture is not to be like the culture. It's not to just follow and agree with everything the culture says. There are some things that the culture is saying today that we have said as a church for 2,000 years. But there are other things that are being said today that is a redefinition of what we have said for 2,000 years. And, and so, trying to be woke, and I mean, we're just going to be woke, we're going to be cool, we're going to be hip, we're going to be able to you know, get in with this group, and that's the best way we can witness to them. No, I tell you what makes a witness and always makes a witness, and that's boldness. To be bold. And to be bold is to tell truth from the standpoint of reality. Okay? That's, it's not popular. Okay? It's not popular. Uh, some of this will get us some hashtags, not hashtags, but we'll get little notifications on our Facebook. Uh, after this video is over, okay? But because uh, the, the engines are listening to the collections of words, and when they hear the right words, they put the stuff out. So I'm trying to be a little bit careful about that, but at the same time, I want to tell you that some of the stuff that you're being told uh, that, that Christians are against, Christians are not against, and they haven't been against, and some of this other stuff that Christians have to be for, Christians are not for and have never been for. It's not part of our Christianity. We're being told today, uh, for instance, uh, the Bible tells us that sin is an individual thing. That, that we are individually, separately sinners. And that we individually and separately have to be redeemed from our sin. The culture is telling us that it's a group thing. There are certain groups that are sinful. There are certain groups that uh, have alleviated most of that sin. And that these, the, the salvation of the sinful group is to become the unsinful group through a variety of processes. And that all sounds wonderful, and there's some things uh, certainly to that, but that certainly overruns the idea that every single one of us from whatever group we're from is individually responsible for our sins. And we have to individually be redeemed for those sins. And we have to be redeemed by Jesus. And to say that today, 
for you to say that is going to take boldness. Same boldness that Peter had. Not sure what even was going to happen to him. So these guys are trying to figure this out. And in the next verse it says, uh, in verse 14, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, now they had nothing to say in opposition. It's kind of hard to say when that guy is actually healed and he's actually standing with a big smile on his face right beside them. So it says uh, then, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying in verse 16, uh, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign had been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Though there's a word is out, and we can't deny it. Next verse, he says, But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more, uh, to, not to speak to anyone in His name, because we don't want that power of vacuum. Well, we want to maintain our control, and we don't want this to spread any more. So we just need to tell them not to do it any more. Now what's interesting, if you'll just look at that, if you'll think about what you just read, uh, what they said, they did not deny it intellectually. Because they obviously saw it. They saw the man standing there. It was not a story. It was not a, well, we heard that you had healed somebody. The guy's standing right there, and they know the guys that will go on to say in Scripture later, he was some 40 years old. He'd been like this perhaps his entire life. It was obvious what he had done. It was very notable. Everybody in town knew it. We can't deny it. It'll make us look bad. What are we going to do about it? But what you don't hear them say is, I believe. Right? You don't hear them say, well, since He did this and it was in the name of Jesus, then Jesus must be who they say He is. Why? Because unbelief, here's a statement here, unbelief is not an intellectual head issue and it never is. It's always a moral heart issue. Unbelief is not the result of you taking factual information and the pros outweighing the cons or you factually, that, that's not where belief ever comes from. Belief comes from the heart. And when people deny it, when they deny the obvious and revealed truths of Scripture, the, the witness of over 500 people who saw Jesus walking, the, the witness of 12 who gave up their lives rather than recant their story, the witness of thousands through the ages and churches that have suffered through persecutions and have grown despite it all, and when they have seen the witness of people that you have known who have overcome abuse, who have overcome alcoholism, who have overcome their addictions, who have overcome a, a bad marriage, who have overcome all of these things in life and have been redeemed and restored through the power of God, when they see that and they still don't believe, it's not because of intellectual. It's not because they haven't been intellectually, they'll say that, but it's not because of that. It's because of a moral heart issue people don't want to believe. They, don't, they choose not to because it means I'm going to have to change my heart. I'm going to have to change my morals. I'm going to have to change my priorities. I'm going to have to change the principles that I live by, the direction of life that I've been going. And these Sanhedrin people would not change. So, verse 18, they called them back in and they just charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Uh, this is all we can do right now. Now later they're going to they're gonna put the whoop to them. But right now, they're so stunned by these guys being so eloquent and by the, the, what's standing in front of them, this man who's been restored, that I don't know, uh, let's just yell at them and threaten them which is what we were going to do in the first place, and then we'll just let them go. So they said they're going to charge him not to speak. But Peter and John answered them, well, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. In other words, you guys are supposed to be representing the voice of God. That's the Sanhedrin, the 70. They're supposed to represent God's Word on stuff. So you'll have to decide whether we should listen to you or to listen to God. In other words, uh, we, I, I'm getting two different things here. I know what God has told me to do, and what you're telling me to do is different. So whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, but, next verse, 
we cannot but speak of what we've seen in her. We're not going to change. Uh, we've seen this. This is not a preference. This is a reality. Our truth is not based on what's popular. Our truth is based on what we've actually seen and heard. We've seen lives change. We've seen Jesus walk. We've seen the truth come together. And because of that, no matter whether it's popular or not, you'll have to decide whether it's right or wrong, but we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. So let me give you this statement, and that is that if your courage to witness for Jesus has weakened, then pray that your boldness will increase. That's what you need. It's not that you need a better argument, a better debate, a lot more scientific data, uh, a, a bigger following on YouTube. Now, if your uh, courage to witness to others in this cancel culture, in this environment, if you're just thinking, I just want to go and hide, okay? I just want to get away as far away as I can from all of this. If your courage to witness for Jesus, which is what you're called to do as long as you're breathing. If you're not breathing, you're let go. But as long as you're breathing, you're called to be a witness for Christ if you're a follower. And if your courage to witness for Jesus has weakened, then what we need is not all of that cleverness. What we need is all that boldness. And what we won't maybe look at next week, but what these guys will do, because they're going to get turned loose and they're going to go to their friends and they're going to tell them what happened and their friends are going to pray for boldness. And boldness is what Crossroads needs. Not a lot of cleverness. Not a lot of this is and that's, I think. What we need in our lives is the boldness to say Jesus is real. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the only name given under heaven among men by which you may be saved. Jesus is what you need in your life. Uh, Jesus is the answer uh, for uh, learning how to model your life, to imitate Him, to have the boldness to be able to say that. Uh, sometimes we just have to ask God for that. We have to ask for that in our prayer. And that's what I want to pray for our church. I want to pray that we have boldness. I want to pray that in these coming years, which are going to be very dicey years for us, I'm going to pray that your pastor doesn't get so caught up in wanting to be... Because I know exactly what the world is wanting me to agree with and to go along with, that, uh, that I, I don't mix up the truth and error and that I wind up getting swept away by some fad and lose the sight of the reality that is actual truth. Okay? That, that I don't become so concerned about being politically correct that I become biblically untrue. I want to pray for all of us that we will, uh, if, if you're a teacher, uh, which is the front lines of critical race theory, it is the front lines of the new movement to redefine what is true and what is not, that, that, that you will have boldness, even the boldness that might cause you to lose your job, that if you are in some sort of public position where if you say the wrong things, you will get fired because it makes people look good to fire you because it makes them seem more accepted that you'll have boldness. That if you're retired and you're, you're confronting your children and grandchildren who are caught up in, the, in, the, in all the mesh of all of this political correctness and this new way of thinking, that you will have the boldness to say what is true and to allow God to do what God does with His truth, which is to change lives and to bring condemnation. I want to pray for you. Father,